Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. We bring you thought-provoking guests and topics every week to challenge your thinking about leadership. Our aim is to help you become the leader that you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm greatly honoured today to be joined by Jerome Myers. Jerome is the founder of an organisation called Pow Wow at the Mountaintop and the Myers Development Group. And he focuses on helping leaders to achieve high performance without burning out. And I'm really curious for myself today, my own education, my own curiosity about some of the things that we're going to learn from Jerome today. And I'm sure that all of you in the audience are going to get some great benefit from Jerome today. So without any further ado, Jerome, can you please give us a brief introduction of yourself and some of that rich background that led you to do this impactful work that you do today? Yeah, I mean, I got a phone call at 4.55 on December 24th, 2015. And it went something like this. Hey, Jerome, we're going to lay half the team off. And I said, no, we're not. That's not the right answer. And he said, yeah, it is. That's what we're going to do. And this isn't a negotiation. You and I have been going back and forth for a while. And I've made a decision. And I'm calling to inform you of a decision, not negotiate or barter with you. And he said, well, I hear you, but I don't believe that's the right answer. We're going to need these folks. And he said, yeah, yeah, Jerome. You know, we went back and forth for a couple more minutes. Then he said, look, man, I'm going to go spend the rest of the year with my family. I'll talk to you in the new year. And he hung up the phone because he was over the conversation we were having. See, the backstory to that is on January 13th, I started at a new company. I was employee number two. We had zero dollars in revenue. And over the course of about nine months, we went to about 175 folks on my team. End of the year, we had $20 million in revenue and about 30 percent profit margins. So for me to be the axe man after having six million dollars in profit, it was a a little difficult for me to understand why we were doing that. And so I blamed everybody else. I said, they're making me do this. I put together a plan and said, look, we're going to make this as objective as possible. We're going to do this based on performance. We're going to do this based on output. And the folks who did well, they'll be able to find a place to stay. The folks that didn't, the ones who weren't efficient and ones who weren't effective, well, they probably shouldn't be here anyway. And this is just a point for us to do some cleaning house pruning, as some folks like to call it. But there's something I realized, Mick, and it was leadership is personal. Leadership is personal. A lot of people say, oh, it's just business, but that's just to create cognitive dissonance so you can do something that you know is going to be negatively impactful to the people that you're interacting with or engaging with. And so I took it personal. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I struggled with it, right? And so when I got there, and every year when I get to the holidays, I struggle just a little bit, right? Because I know somewhere in the world, somebody's getting laid off at this time. And they don't know why they're getting laid off. Most of them, they just know that this happens and it happens year after year after year. And so we put Humpty Dumpty back together again with our smaller, leaner, meaner crew. And we had the same production goals that we needed to get done. And Mick, we did it. But this time it was a couple of days before Thanksgiving when I'm standing in front of the room and I tell the team, please don't spend all your money on Black Friday, the holiday that we celebrate here the day after Thanksgiving in the States. And they kind of looked at me confused. And the longer they stared at me, the more I felt my leadership credibility oozing out of my body and onto the floor. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I need the buck to stop with me. I don't want to be uncertain when I'm leading a group of folks on what the outcome is going to be. And so I, I exited corporate America and I went and started doing some real estate stuff. And after a while, I realized this is lonely. It's just me and the deal. Right. And the people that I talk to, they don't really care unless they have money invested in the deal. So I need to find find a way to get back to the only thing that I missed from corporate America, which was helping folks grow as leaders, right? When you go from two people to 175, your organization doesn't have the folks sitting on the bench ready to get them in the game from a leadership standpoint. And so we had to grow our leaders in order to allow them to perform at an optimal level, improve retention and a lot of the other things that go into having a strong leadership bench. And so I went and started doing that. And so we've put together a program for 
leadership development for companies. We focus primarily on financial services, but it's applicable across multiple industries. And then we work with founders who are looking to go to the next level or they're looking to exit depending on where they are on the trajectory and help them navigate the issues that they are working through in their businesses. So I, I don't know if that was too deep or too low or too high, but hopefully that gives us some stuff to dig in and have a conversation. Yeah, that was brilliant, Jerome. And I'm sorry that you went through that on a Christmas Eve, 4.50 in the afternoon to get a bombshell like that. And then for the leader to just say, okay, now I'm off to spend time with my family and have a good time. It's The timing is unbelievable, but I think the thinking behind the decision is also very curious. But what I'd like to know about Jerome Myers, though, what did you learn about yourself through that period of that Christmas Eve? And then you're talking about Thanksgiving and I'm hearing an incongruous where you none of it sat well with you. What did you learn about yourself? Yeah, I, I'm so grateful you asked this question. So what I learned about myself is it's okay to be the guy that cares too much because that's the reputation that I earned in the organization. Can Jerome make, and it was a negative one, can Jerome make the tough choices knowing how much he cares about his team? And I'm okay with being the guy that cares too much. But here's the other piece of it. I learned that I have a choice and that other people don't dictate what you choose to do. You do. And so when I said, hey, I don't have a choice. They're making me do it. I did. But I gave up my agency. And so when we think about trauma, people feel like they lose their voice, they lose their choice, and they lose their ability to make decisions, right? I think all three of those applied in this situation. The organization was making the decision that we were going to do the thing. Thing. And because I was in the organization and I like my paycheck and I like my bonuses and I like my company truck, I decided to stay there and do the bidding of what the company said. Not because I thought it was the right thing, but because they told me that it was the right thing. And so, so many people are in institutions where they are experiencing these situations. And it's because as leaders, we're not taking this personal. We're not taking our leadership responsibility personally. And you see it show up with the people who are quite quitting. You see the people, you see it show up with the people who say, why would I be loyal to this organization when I know you're not going to be loyal to me, which is the eighth pillar of the framework that we've created for leadership. And so that's what I learned. I learned that I had a choice and I also learned that when you take leadership personally, you do things a little bit differently. So I'm hearing a few powerful things there, Jerome. One is you've used the word personal multiple times in this interview so far. I want to dig into that. What do you mean by personal? Personal. So have you ever seen somebody do something positive or kind after they say the words, oh, it's just business? All the time. Yeah. Very common. I've never seen them do it ever. Not a single person. Oh, sorry. When they do the kind thing, they say it's, oh, sorry, I, I misunderstood what you were just saying. Yeah. If they've got good news, they don't say, oh, sorry, this is just business. It's, it's always the delivery of that nasty message is, you know, sorry, it's just business. Yeah. All right. Got it. And so let's unpack that, right? Because business only gets done when two people want business to get done. So why is it that when we want to do something that's unpleasant, we blame it on the business. And when we want something, we want to make it personal. All sales is influence, right? So how do we get to the place where we can influence people? Well, we have to build trust. Well, how do we get to a place where people trust us? Well, we have to reveal pieces of us so that we can find commonalities and connection. But as soon as we're going to do something else, we want to separate the two, create this distance so we can do the thing that is what I consider to be unnatural, right? And we want to make it this inanimate object that doesn't have any feelings as if it's a rock. But at the end of the day, you're still dealing with the person. And so there's a lot of companies out there. I won't say a lot. There are a few industry leading companies out there that do things and handle people as humans. They see the humanity in the folks that they're dealing with. And when they see the humanity, they make a different decision. Like I think it's Zappos, where if if you come in and you get to a certain point, they offer you a bonus to leave, right? They offer you multiple weeks pay to leave so that when they, the people who actually stay, they create this culture where I chose to be here. The short term money wasn't the win. When you look at folks who decide to leave an organization, are they leaving the organization or are they leaving the person that they're reporting to more often than not? They're usually leaving their boss. 
And so is that because their relationship wasn't strong? I'm always going to offer that the answer is yes, because if the relationship is strong and they feel a sense of community, they feel a sense of protection, then why would they ever go anywhere else? Because they're going to pay more after you get to a certain income level. And I'm thinking about knowledge workers at this point. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It's not going to make that much of a difference in your life. And like moving from one company to the other for I remember I left one company for an extra eight hundred dollars a month. What was I going to do? Buy a car? Like, I mean, what difference was that money really going to make for me in my position? And it didn't. And you know what I did with that money? I bought a car. Right. And I already had to. So did I need the third one? I didn't. It didn't make any real difference in my life. And so I guess what I'm trying to get to, and I'm using a lot of words, leadership is the thing that makes the relationships work. Leadership is the thing that creates the culture. The culture is the thing that creates the client experience. The client experience is the thing that drives the referrals. The referrals is the things that makes our business continue to grow. And so you can talk about the bottom line, but if you do the things and treat people like people, use humanity, make things personal, care at a level more than what other people think is appropriate, then when you get all the way to the bottom, when you're talking about the bottom line, the results will speak for themselves. And that's our perspective. And so leadership is personal because it impacts the bottom line. Yeah, brilliant. So Jerome, I love this description that you're giving. I want to borrow some things from John C. Maxwell here for a second. I think he describes this really well as well. Yeah. And in this case, I really believe with what he's saying. So his view is that all businesses are people businesses. And if you don't understand people, you don't understand business. And what I'm hearing from you here, Jerome, is you've got to remember that every one of these people that you're talking about are then the ambassadors of your business. So how you treat them is going to be a reflection then of how much effort and care and how much they take their own work personally and how they treat your customers. And that's going to have huge impact on whether you continue to thrive as an organization. So you used the word humanity before. So treating people with humanity is then what is actually going to drive the success of your business and a short-term decision that might achieve a short-term return for shareholders is going to have a long-term impact on the businesses. That's what I'm hearing from you, Jerome. How does that sit with you? It sits really well with me. When businesses are cold, I think it just gets really ugly. And there is no goodwill. There is no extension. There is no grace. And we all need that with our customers and our clients, right? Because if we don't, then when we make a mistake, there isn't an opportunity for us to correct it. And so the reputation goes down and it continues to go down. And I call it the toilet bowl. We just continue to spend because nobody's willing to say, hold on, wait, these guys have great intentions. Something went wrong there or here. And if we just press pause, we're certain that they'll get it right. We're certain that they'll fix it. Yeah, brilliant. And that's what is then trust because there's been that development of a relationship between the two of you. So when you do get in tough times, for example, you're going to trust those around you that they're going to make the decisions that make sense for everyone, including you in the team. That makes complete sense as well. What I want to unpack, and this is going to be pretty challenging, we'll we'll see here. So what I'm hearing from you, Jerome, about this, when there's good news to be shared, it's great, it's personal, it's caring, blah, blah, blah. But then as soon as there's bad news to be shared, it was all, oh, it's just business or blaming someone else is essentially what you were doing. What advice can you give to leaders out there about how to deliver bad news? Because sometimes there are bad results this quarter or what, it might not be a layoff, but there might be some times where you need to stand in front of your team and say, hey, team, we lost a contract that we really thought we were going to win or whatever the case may be. How do you deliver bad news in a way that is still personal and caring? Yeah, I think, first of all, it's important not to frame news as good or bad. They're just events that happened, right? That, for me, is really important, fundamentally and foundationally. Then from there, I think we communicate what we know to be facts. These are the facts so that you understand where we are. Then we add on, well, what does this mean for us? And based on our programming, we interpret the things that happen in a couple of different ways. It happened to us or it happened for us. If something is 
challenging, it's creating some headwind, it's an opportunity or it's a problem. You get to choose those words and how you see it. And so if there's a way to say, hey, we're not going to put out bonuses this year because we didn't hit our financial target. These are the financial targets. Here was the goal. Present the fact. Does everybody agree that we didn't hit them? Now, some people may be trying to figure out, okay, so why didn't we hit them? That part doesn't matter. The fact is that this is what we were trying to do and we didn't do that. So what are we going to do about this? Because we know what the goal is for the upcoming year. Are we going to make sure that we hit it? Are there some things that we missed along the way? And this is when the backstory matters. Now, can we find the root cause that created the situation that we did not like? And if we can find that root cause, how can we engineer or create a process that eliminates that opportunity from happening again so we don't get the outcome that we did not desire? The other thing that I think is always important is if you're going through a process, you've got some leading indicators that let you know whether you're on track in order to hit the outcome that you're looking to achieve. Some milestones along the way to let you know if you're on track to hit the thing that you plan on achieving. You think about, we talk about the Super Bowl, right? There were, the game was tied up until like the last minute, last two minutes and something happened. Somebody blew an assignment, but that's not the only reason that the Philadelphia Eagles didn't win the game. There were spots along the way where mistakes were made. There were spots along the way where there were spectacular efforts on the other side that put them at an advantage. Now, at the end of each quarter, there was a milestone check and say, hey, we're here. And then at the two minute warning, there was probably another milestone check. At the end of the day, can the Eagles go back, figure out where they made the mistakes and then go back and look for a better outcome? I think they absolutely can. Where there's some other indicators along the way that let them know that, hey, we might not get the outcome we desire. Absolutely. And so as leaders, we've got to be able to create the dashboards to create visibility so people know what's going on. Because I don't think people get upset about the outcome. I think people get upset when they get the outcome that they didn't expect. And we, by us as leaders, helping create visibility for the things that we're working towards and the progress that we're making towards those things, we set them up so that when we get to the end of the road, the destination, they know exactly what we were going to get there, where we were going to be. And when you eliminate the element of surprise, it's a whole lot easier for them to be able to adjust and make plans or plan their life as a result of what's going to happen. If I'm counting on that bonus to put in my pool and I don't get the bonus, that might be the challenging thing. You know what I mean? But if I know that the bonus isn't going to come for the pool, then maybe I got to work part time or I got to do this or got to do that in order to find another ways to pay for that. So what I'm hearing there is about clarity of communication and keeping it very open and transparent as much as you possibly can so everyone feels like they're part of the journey along the way. And I'm also hearing this great analogy there around the Super Bowl that it's really just a single moment that leads to win or loss. It's usually a collection of journey events. You could even say the entire season were all things to whether they even got to the Super Bowl in the first place. They're all things that contributed to whether that was a success successful year or not successful year for that organization and having that open and transparent communication along the way, people don't feel surprised so much at the end as to, to what's there because they're already part of the conversation is what I'm hearing there. What I'd like to go back to is that almost that word blame, Jerome. So, and this could be anything from a decision that's been passed down from senior executive leadership, or it could be a HR policy, right? So the HR policy of the company says, dit, 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 dit. And as the leader, you're expected to sometimes enforce that HR policy. But if you sit in front of your team and say, oh, this is not me, it's the policy, what does it say about your leadership? It says that your leadership isn't personal, right? Let's be clear. As soon as you pass the buck, you lose your leadership credibility because it says that you're willing to do something that you don't believe in. And for me, that's out of integrity. And I know organizations are really large and I know that you don't have complete autonomy in the business that you run. But if there's an issue with the policy and you're not willing to go out and do something about the policy, I think it creates some big issues for you. And I'm not sure how you look yourself in the mirror. And maybe it's not important for you to look yourself in the mirror, but eventually that gets old. 
Very much. And this is where you can lead to incongruence and waking up one day and going, who have I become? This is not me anymore, right? And you said something really powerful before. I want to play that back to you as well, Jerome. When you lose your voice, you lose your choice, I think was the the term that you used. What advice have you got to people out there that might be sitting there listening to this right now going, oh, wow, Jerome, he's describing me. There's things happening in my company that I'm not happy with, that they're making choices to just go along with it to protect their job or they feel like they're not empowered to speak up and say something about it. What advice have you got to a leader that might be out there going, yeah, I'm not happy with some of the decisions we're making as a company and I am just going along with it and I should be speaking up? One, be sure when you speak up that it's something that you truly believe in. You've got to be extremely clear on what your morals and values are. You've got to understand what your principles are so that you maintain your integrity. There are opportunities where people do not like the resistance. And that may mean that you can no longer serve in the capacity that you're serving in. And it might not be at your choice. And for some people, that is the worst thing that can happen in their world. They can't imagine what they would do if they didn't have the position that they have. And so if that's you, this probably isn't for you because you're not going to make any change because the organization is resistant to change. It is existing as it is, and they will find somebody else who's willing to be the cog in the wheel. And that's okay. But for the people who are certain about the thing, for the people who know what they want and they have great reasons for why this is the way it should be, then I think as a leader, it's your responsibility to speak up. And when you speak up, it needs to be well thought out. It needs to be respectful, right? Because the person you're giving the feedback to may take it personally. And you want them to know that you see them as a human and that you're advocating for people to be treated as humans. Because that's the only reason that I think you should probably be rebelling, air quotes around rebelling, around the system that's been created. From there, it turns into a conversation, a dialogue, an experience where you can create actual change. Because most change is not revolutionary, it's evolutionary. Evolutionary. And so your ability to steer and navigate that through multiple iterations is what I think makes the biggest difference in the world. Sure, you could try to ball up the paper or be a terrorist and try to make change instantly. That doesn't work normally. The system's big, right? The framework has been there for a long time. So the goal is to get folks to see the perspective, see where the assumptions were faulty, and then make an adjustment because this doesn't and serve who the organization is today. And as we've seen it, right? Like think about uh, for the folks who aren't in the U.S., there was a war between the North and the South. And in the South, there were statues of people who were in the Confederate Army. And over the past few years, and buildings named after some of those Confederate soldiers. And over the past few years, colleges have been renamed, buildings have been renamed, statues have been taken down. And it's because we had a faulty assumption that this is who we were and what should be represented and who should be commemorated. And over time, we've accepted that just doesn't represent who we are as a country anymore. And so that took time. That didn't happen immediately. That didn't help because people pulled over statues or started spray painting and defaming things. Those were just displays of their outrage. But the people who actually worked on the policy and got the funding to get that stuff done did the work that was necessary in order to make these adjustments and changes. And so, you know, if we can do that, imagine what we can do in corporations. That's a really powerful message, Jerome. I'm hearing three things there. So the first one I'm hearing is an element of pick your battles so that you're not the person that's turning up to work every day and being the agitator because that's going to become exhausting for you and other people will soon tire of that as well. But the battles that you're picking, number two that I'm hearing is the battles that you're picking are the ones that are aligned to your values and beliefs, the ones that will sit with you into the future, that you'll be proud of being congruent with your values and beliefs. And then the third one is that change does take time. So if you're in a deeply set culture that's been building over time, don't expect that you're going to be able to change it in one go. That's not an excuse to not do it, but don't expect you're going to just turn a culture around in 24 hours. It's going to take time and you might need to be very intentional and tactical and almost strategic in how you go about affecting that change. So pick your battles, values and beliefs and know that the change is going to take time. How does that sit, Jerome? 
I think it's an amazing summary of what I said in a lot of words. <laughs> yeah, very good. And there was a fourth one was that you may also get to the part where you wake up one day and go, actually, you know what, the values and beliefs of this company or this culture don't sit well with me and I am going to eventually set out to test what my options might be and start looking elsewhere. But I've heard that that's after a, a time where you've actually tried to change things before you leave. I think you have to exhaust all your resources, all your options before you take that option because you're there and you're observing the situation because you're somebody that can impact it. There's so many people that just turn a blind eye to issues and just pretend like they don't exist or pretend like they're not somebody who can impact it. But you wouldn't be there witnessing it if you didn't have ability to impact. Yeah, brilliant, Troy. All right, now I want to head this towards performance now. So we've been talking a lot about caring and we spoke about if you do care about people, they will drive the results in your business. But the one I want to test with you here, I'm going to talk about Hofstetter's dilemmas and he has multiple dilemmas that he talks about, but one of the big ones is the dilemma between caring and performance. And to paint the, the picture here, to go exaggeration on both ends, if you have an organisation that's 100% about caring and doesn't care about performance. It's a great time. Everyone loves each other. It's singing Kumbaya every day and, you know, it's it becomes a social club and there's no accountability for performance. And if you go the other way, you go 100% performance and you don't end up with caring, you end up with bosses that are calling you on Christmas Eve to tell you that people are getting laid off and don't care. Business is business and it's very wash your hands of any personal accountability now, not business accountability. So So tell me your advice. How does a leader balance caring and performance? Yeah, I think that those are not on the same axis. I don't think the pendulum swings between the two. In fact, I think the more you care, the higher the performance is because you grow your expectations and you know how to optimize and get the most out of the resources that are being employed in order to achieve or accomplish the mission. So I think the more you care, the higher the performance, because think about it. There's a ton of discretionary effort that our employees have, and they get to decide whether they use that in our business, use that sitting on the couch, use that with their kids. There's so many places where they can place that energy. But usually what happens is they place it in the rooms, in the compartments, in the departments where they feel like they're going to be appreciated the most. And so part of caring is appreciation and gratitude from my perspective. And so if we're showing folks that we really enjoy what they're doing for us, we recognize the effort that they're putting in. Do you not think that they're going to seek more of that because I'm very good at the affirmation piece for people who do what we want, right? Positive affirmations beget more people doing the thing that we want done. And I think the stick is necessary from time to time, but carrot, carrot, carrot for those who are pleasure seeking gets a level of rewards that fear will never get. And I think that's the majority of the motivation that a lot of leaders use when they go from come from an authoritative standpoint. They're Their goal is to get people to fear them so that they'll do this stuff instead of influence or inspire or motivate them to do this stuff because, well, this person is going to really appreciate me or I don't want to let this person down. I don't think there's anything more motivating for a person than I don't want to let this person who sees stuff in me and believes in me in a way that I don't myself. I don't know any. For me, that's been the most motivating things that I've ever encountered. So what I'm seeing there is that will certainly drive a lot of loyalty. So if you have spent that time showing someone that you believe in them, that will drive a a lot of loyalty for sure. And I like this emphasis around celebrating and rewarding the behaviors that you want to see and that then fuels a a repetition of those behaviors, etc. The one bit missing that I'd like to ask is what about accountability? So how do you, in that caring environment, how do you still drive accountability? I love that you asked this question. So here's the thing. If there is no relationship and you try to use accountability, it will just sound like hazing or it will feel like bullying. You don't have the right to hold people accountable outside of some authoritative structure if you don't have a relationship with them. Think about it. I don't think anybody wants the police to come tell them what to do. The only reason that they listen is because they have a badge, right? But if you walk up on somebody who's doing something that they probably shouldn't be doing and 
and you mention and you have a relationship with them and you say, hey, blah, 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 blah. You probably should do something different. The way they're going to receive that, I think is going to be very different, regardless of their personality type. If you have a relationship, you have influence. And I, it's going to remain. And I've noticed this as well. Back to the police example. As soon as the police leave, they go back to doing what they were doing. They didn't actually change their behavior. They just modified it because the person was there to keep them from doing it. As soon as they leave, they go back to doing the thing. Versus you can actually make an adjustment in the way that people behave when the person's not in the room, if or when you have influence and use that influence. You know what you got me thinking of, Jerome? I want to share this with you and, and see how this sits with you. The more, the deeper the relationship, the more this is going to be impactful. I think about all of the times in my life where I have, I'm, I'm a human being. I make mistakes. I've made plenty, Jerome. And what was the worst part about the mistake was the feeling that I'd let someone down that I love or care about. Sometimes letting myself down, that hurts. But when I let someone down that I truly Truly respect, love, and care for that hurts more than any punishment or sanction that might have been passed down to me. And that's what I remember. I remember the feeling of, oh, that person really cares about me and I let them down, and I care about them and I let them down. So, what I'm hearing there is when you have that relationship, that's what's going to drive the accountability because you don't want to let that person down. And when you do let them down, it becomes a huge lesson that you can learn from and grow from. How does that sit with you? amazingly well. And to add to that, you're going to do what you can to actually fix it, right? When you don't care about the other people involved, oh, I just dropped the ball. Okay, great. Right. That's the end of it. They move on. But no, it's bigger than that. And I'm going to do what I can to make sure that I don't inflict that pain again. This goes back to the humanity piece of it. And for some folks who are listening to this, they're squirming because they're like, this is so messy. Like, why can't we just use the excuse that it's just business and move on? But think about how how well the organization will work. Think about how many CYA emails go away when people are actually playing the game cards face up. They're not trying to manipulate, control, undermine because they actually see each other as humans and they want the best for each other. And they believe that we rise together, right? There's this Swahili saying or word called Ubuntu. And basically it's, I am because we are. And so when you actually embrace that, when you actually embody that, I don't think anything can stop. Because now we go together. And I know that the weakest link is the thing that might hold us, break us, slow us down. So how do we make sure we shield that person? How do we make sure we put them in success likely situations and put other people in those areas where they might not be as strong? The magic of that, because everybody has strengths, everybody has unique gifts. Or if they don't, are we not being caring if we say, hey, this isn't the right fit for you? You're not happy. We're not happy. And there's plenty of places that would be happy for you. Is that not caring? Caring? Yeah, good one. So that's another example of caring at the point of separation. It's you're going to leave on good terms. The other person is going to go and find something that does light their heart on fire and it's done in a caring environment. So what I'm hearing here is that there's almost nothing more powerful than a, a team that daily, deeply cares about each other and looks out for each other and they're in the journey together because they're going to drive collective performance. They're going to drive collective and individual accountability amongst themselves. They're going to drive that accountability amongst themselves because they care about each other. This is really powerful stuff. All right. Very good, Jerome. Now, you also brought up quiet quitting before, right? And there's a lot of people out there, by the way, and I've been wanting to have this conversation for a while now. There's a few people out there that are saying, oh, quiet quitting doesn't even exist. And what they use is they use stats that there's actually hasn't been any reduction in the number of hours worked. But what you were mentioning before is the discretionary effort. For me, quiet quitting is not at all about how many hours they're working like and there's an element of it right where there's the protest of people going to their job description and say sorry my work hours are nine to five do not call me at three minutes past five but to me it's not about the work hours at all it's about the discretionary effort and it's about the disengagement that they might be sitting in their chair in an office somewhere but they're actually spending their most of their mental space is thinking about what are they doing on the weekend or they're surfing facebook they're not truly engaged to their work. So in this kind of caring environment that you're talking about, how do we reconnect people to their work to the point where they care deeply about that and they do unlock that discretionary effort and they're being more impactful in what they do? 
Yeah, it's interesting for anybody who says that folks aren't quiet quitting and they cite whatever they cite. I think for over a decade, maybe a decade and a half, Gallup has been reporting that about 85 percent of people are not engaged in their work. And so just because they show up to work does not mean that they are productive. Just because they show up to work does not mean that they're mentally present. And for me, that's quiet quitting, because if they're not doing either one of those things, then we're not as operators, owners, managers, leaders, we're not getting the production that we should be getting out of the folks that are on our team. I don't know how that's an arguable fact or point, or even, I don't even know how that's not an opinion and not a fact. So put that to the side and we we start to go down this path of, well, how do you actually get to a place of getting people engaged? Are they engaged because they find the work interesting? And we've got this model in our, this frame, in our framework for a centered life called the red pill and level three for us is work. And we look for four eyes for inspired work. We want people to be interested. We want them to make the income. They want them to have influence and we want them to be able to see their impact. Those four things are necessary in order for a person to feel like they have inspired work. If one of those is missing, they're going to have a complaint and they're going to be looking for ways in order to shift that, grow that. And so they may have influence, impact and interest, but they don't have the income. And if they've got a financial challenge that they need to overcome, they will swing the pendulum to go find more income. If they're not interested in their work, which is what most people are complaining about or struggling with, well, we've got one or two options. They either keep doing that because it pays well. And this is what we see most commonly is people continue to do things, not because they feel like they're having influence, impact or interest, but because it pays well. And I personally believe it's they're suffering. And I think they're doing the world a disservice because there's so many other things things that they could be doing to positively impact the world and where they get excited to use their discretionary effort because they know that they're making an impact. They know that they're influencing the outcome and they know that this is something that they are interested in. And so they're curious about how they can do it better. I'll never forget my dad telling me that he was perfecting the art of parachuting. He was perfecting the art of parachuting. He was a military paratrooper and he was perfecting the art of parachuting. Now it was a very small percentage of his job. But it was something he was extremely passionate about. And his passion was about making sure that every soldier that was enlisted in his care in that jumbo jet made it to the ground safely. Every single one of them, including him. That meant that he perfected the art because people were not getting hurt when they did this very dangerous activity. But it was something that was necessary because of whatever might happen if we went into conflict. So who's making art right now? Right. You're making art on this podcast. You're processing the things that I'm saying and then distilling it down to short sentences that the listener can walk away with as as a takeaway lesson. I'm doing my best to create art from the standpoint of making practical examples of how these, what I think in some regards are complicated philosophies can be made real for the folks who may have never considered these things. Your editors are going to go through and figure out the stuff that should and shouldn't be here so that when we present this to the audience, they can get it. So if we're taking that for this time that we have together, for the person that consumes this, what are you doing to make art? Because that's what we're all here for. And when we're actually being artists, I think that is when we start truly making an impact on life, the life of others. And that's when we hit level six of our model, which is significance. We're positively impacting the lives of other people. We're not just doing something to collect a paycheck. And I can assure you that's going to be more rewarding than any bonus or any amount of money that you can ever make because you can find fulfillment. This is really powerful on so many levels, Jerome. So what I'm hearing here is your ingredients for engagement is the person has to be interested and we know that we always do better work when we're interested in what we're doing. That's just human nature. They need an income and that income, everyone's got to put a roof over their head, but it needs, there needs to be a reward for what they're doing and it's a fair reward for fair work, right? That needs to be influenced. And what I'm hearing there, Jerome, is someone needs to feel like they've got some level of empowerment to be able to do 
what they do. So empowerment and enablement. Otherwise, they're just a cog in a wheel. And the last one then I think is is really powerful is the impact. And that's going to lead you towards feeling significant and feeling like you matter. And when you feel like you matter, that's when you're going to unlock that discretionary effort. That's when you're going to go and put your heart and soul into everything you do. And on this word impact, I'm not going to say that any of the four are more important than each other, but I think that's one of the ones that has been lost a lot of along the way where people have forgotten the impact of what they're doing. They've forgotten why they're doing what they're doing. And when you've forgotten why you're doing what you're doing, you start scratching your head and going, hang on a second, why am I doing this again? So as a leader, if we can help people stay interested, have income or reward, to have the influence over what they're doing and to then to understand the impact, the personal impact of what they do today has an impact on another person's life, then they're going to unlock that discretionary effort and engage to their work. How does that sit with you, Jerome? I think it's pretty simple. I think we got it. Yeah. And yet the Gallup numbers, there was another report yesterday, by the way, is brilliant that you brought that up. Yesterday's report, the number dipped again, right? So it's the Gallup numbers are telling us that more and more people are disengaging the workplace. And what's missing is the feeling that what they do matters, that they matter, and that there's a purpose in what they're doing. And that caring environment that you talk about as well, Jerome. All right. So that's probably going to bring us towards an end, but I'd love to know more about Powwow at the mountaintop. Tell us about what, it's a great name. What does all that mean? Yeah. So the powwow at the mountaintop is a mastermind that we designed for folks who were in the process of leaving their careers or just outside of leaving their careers and looking to become founders. They want to start their own thing. They're not sure how to do it. They've usually been in an organization that's got a ton of resources and they've got to figure out how to get scrappy or all of their friends still have jobs. And now they're out here in the entrepreneurial space and they don't have any network. They don't know what questions to ask and the people that they talk to, they don't understand what they have going on. And so one of the most common things that happens, and I feel like spouses or partners are the ones that do it the most, is they say, oh, you don't have to go to work today. Can you do this for me? Run an errand, take care of a chore or something else. And the person says, oh, well, I guess I don't have to go to work today. I'm sure, yeah, I can do that. And they're not working on their business as They worked on the business of somebody else that was employing them. And so we help people navigate what we call this exit crisis, where they're leaving behind the one thing to come into the new thing. And it can be at a bunch of different levels. But traditionally, what we see is is that mid-level manager, maybe a junior level VP who realizes that they're not going to go much higher than organization and they want to start out on that thing on their own. Or it's the top level leader who realized that, hey, my values are incongruent with the organization that I'm in and they need to go have their own autonomy and start their own thing. It's lonely, man. So there's a wolf over my my left shoulder and he's by himself. And it's because I always want to be reminded that you don't make it to the top by yourself. And so think about the powwow as a call for the wolves who are all on their own mountains. So at varying heights and we're calling them down and we're asking them to come back up a mountain together where they have people who are understanding of the situation that they're in. They get the challenges that they're facing and they have some of the answers to the questions that they're asking themselves, but they're scared to ask other people because they feel like they're the only ones that's ever dealt with it and they, they feel like they're alone. That's really powerful, Jerome, and congrats on setting that up. It is scary. It is lonely when you go on these journeys, and I'm glad that you're doing this. I want to share a story with you that happened to me just yesterday. I met an entrepreneur. I think you're going to love this story. So one of the things that a lot of people, when they do decide to go and start their own thing, there's this dream. It's about being your own boss and setting your own hours, and you gave the example of then you don't have to go to work today, so you go and run your errand. And etc. So that's a bit of the dream. I'm going to work from the beach or whatever the case may be. But that is very much rarely the case. And this conversation that I had yesterday was really powerful because this entrepreneur, she didn't say any of those things as to why she had started her own company. Her ambition was to create a company where she would have wanted to work. And I just love that. So she's from the ground up creating a company that she would have wanted to work for if she was a fresh graduate or I just thought that was just a beautiful thing and a great reason to go and start your own thing. That takes courage, man. No, I was just going to say that takes so much courage. 
It does. And by the way, she's been very successful in what she's doing because she cares about the people that work with her. There you go. Coming back to the key theme of your discussion today, Jerome. All right, that brings us to a close now. I'd like to go into a rapid round. So these are the same four questions that we ask all of our guests, Jerome. So the first one, what's the one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? That no matter the situation, you have a choice. Very good. I think a lot of people out there need to hear that right now. Very good, Jerome. What's your favorite book? Sizing People Up by Robin Dree changed my world in 2020. I was meeting so many new people through the internet, particularly LinkedIn. And I was confused because I thought because you like a person, you should trust them. And like and trust are not synonyms. They're very different things and they, you should use different criteria to evaluate them. Okay, very powerful. What's your favorite quote? Your dreams should be real. All right, that's probably a nice plug toward your podcast as well, but I like that. But your podcast is called The Dream Catchers, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, very good. So the dream should be real. Love it. And finally, I'm sure there's going to be people in the audience that are completely intrigued with everything that you shared today, Jerome. How do people get in contact with you to learn more about your work, maybe join the Power Hour at the mountaintop or just learn more about you and your work? Yeah, I took the red pill.co is the place to go to find out more about what we've got going on. And if it resonates with you, get the opportunity to fill out an application so we can see if it's a good fit for both of us. Brilliant, Jerome. We're going to put those links in the show notes as well so people can find it easily. But I, I took the red pill.co. All right, brilliant. Thank you so much, Jerome. I knew that I was going to enjoy today's conversation. I was not disappointed one little bit. It was a very powerful conversation with me. I learned a lot. I know the audience is going to learn a lot from today's episode as well. So thank you so much for joining us and best of luck for the future of all of the impactful work that you're doing with people. Thanks, Matt. This was awesome. Thank you for listening to The Leadership Project at MixBeers.com. A huge call out to Faris Sadek for his video editing of all of our video content and to all of the team at TLP. Joanne Goes On, Gerald Calibo and my amazing wife, Say Spears. I could not do this show without you. Don't forget to subscribe to the Leadership Project YouTube channel where we bring you interesting videos each and every week. And you can follow us on social, particularly on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. Now, in the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other and join us on this journey as we learn together and lead together. 